challenges that you anticipate, you can, um, I think, answer multiple times, hopefully. Um, so take a second to think that through. Um, no wrong answers, right? This is everything under the umbrella of having a presence online. So I'm seeing uh, navigating technology, um, not feeling you need to be accountable to the room and not saying anything. So there might be that sort of, oh, I'm, I'm passively listening. I'm not necessarily expected to engage. Um, when the facilitator feels the, feels the need to fill in silence, uh, when there is no participation at all. Um, I'm seeing participation come up a lot, silence, people not giving you the engagement that you want, how to get feedback as a group when some people are more vocal. Yep, so we'll talk about that, how to manage sort of turn-taking conversation management online, um, checking in for understanding and are they paying attention? This is great. Making sure all attendees feel heard. Yeah, that's definitely um, a challenge, right? thinking about broadcasting this message and is it actually being transmitted? Um, how can we check for comprehension, for feedback, all those considerations? The larger gr the group, the harder it is to get feedback. Just silence when you ask a question. I've definitely encountered that. Not seeing faces and body language. Yep. So this is another real strange dynamic of being online where we have cameras in our faces so we can't really relax into conversations because we're being hyper aware of all of the things our face is doing, but um, we're not able to necessarily assess um, the whole group, right? We have to toggle between different camera streams and it just makes it not the most authentic, comfortable experience using the right technology. Facilitator wants to look at camera while speaking, but that means they cannot see the reactions. This is great, everyone. Thank you. So, uh, you know, not great because there are challenges, but we will talk about uh, strategizing around them. Um, Let's uh, move on to the next question. So this is just a, a bit of a poll. What is the primary challenge for you facilitating conversations online? So um, is it engaging a quiet audience? Is it managing nervousness and speed? Um, how to organize your ideas? Um, when to pause or check in? Um, or you can add in the chat uh, on Zoom something else that's coming up for you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat that some folks had a d bit of difficulty entering the, the Mentimeter. Just let me know if that's still the case because I am seeing folks um, enter their responses. Okay, so we have a lot of folks saying the quiet audience is the main challenge, right? Like how do you respond to a silence that keeps getting bigger? Um, do you ask more questions or is that Taking up space, do you need to leave more of a pause? Yep, so this is definitely something that um, folks are unsure about, right? Because it's hard to gauge. Is this a moment for appropriate silence or is it a spot where I need to jump in and sort of troubleshoot and help my participants get to their um, goal? Okay, so a lot of people with the engaging and quiet, quiet audience, but a smattering of responses for the other ones, right? With nervousness, knowing when to pause and organization. Okay, uh, last question. What is something you hope this presentation will cover? Um, we do have um, sort of limited time, but if I can weave in some of your considerations through my content, or I can follow up with some resources or some other strategies via email through Jessica, um, we can definitely do that. But what's something that you hope uh, we'll be able to talk about today and hold space for? Okay. so. I'm Someone is really interested in specific tools or unique tips or something that they haven't heard before. How to engage with a large audience, um, dealing with silence after asking if people have questions. Absolutely. So often we're, we're giving a lot of content and, you know, giving our full energy and excitement. And then we're met with that really um, debilitating silence. So how do we troubleshoot and navigate that? Interactive activities using tools like Mentimeter, timing breaks. Um, asynchronous engagement, yep. So we will talk more about sort of face-to-face -face online facilitation, but we can definitely uh, follow up with some of the tools to create that engagement when people have to catch up on their own time. Strategies to make sessions more exciting and fun. Um, interactivity, engaging people, making them feel comfortable enough to turn on their camera as if they were in person, I love that one. Um, specific language to help connect to people as humans, addressing accessibility so everyone can participate. Yep, so accessibility is a, a, a huge concern, right? Because we're just, the pandemic and working from home has really highlighted that digital divide and, you know, making assumptions that everyone's has the same robust Wi-Fi or is, you know, getting the information at that 
really intense speed, um, you know, we, who are we disadvantaging if we're just thinking about that fleet, uh, very quick connection, um, engaging audience and encouraging in engagement. Yep. So this is all awesome, everyone. We will definitely touch on these. So give me a moment to get back to my slide deck. Okay. Bit of a lag for me. But that's okay, because slow and steady is the name of the game. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about some of the realities and the challenges that have come up in the online space, not to dissuade us, but just to really acknowledge what we're up against, right? Because these are really considerable barriers. So the first is Zoom burnout. Um, how many of you are feeling that right now <laughs> and screen fatigue after spending hours and hours online? Um, I'm definitely feeling it with working full time, taking my courses part time. And there's a time where I just feel like I cannot be in another Zoom call. I just don't have the capacity or the literal bandwidth in my head to, to incorporate more information coming at me. So that's definitely a challenge for a lot of folks right now. Um, our attention online, right? Uh, we have notifications coming up and screens. Um, so we're kind of up against competition when we're facilitating because folks can bring up another tab or try to multitask. When in fact, we know that multitasking is not an effective strategy to keep up with all of our obligations. So we're already up against that uphill battle. Um, as we talked about before, the technology piece is really hard to determine. Um, you know, some platforms like Black Blackboard Collaborate tell us when users are experiencing lower bandwidth, but really these platforms, we, we sort of assume that everyone is engaging and able to participate um, to the extent we think they are. Um, reading the room, looking for visual feedback, like body language, like on eye contact. And uh, someone else talked about, you know, that silence might be interpreted differently. So for some people, it might be digesting time, time to activate their microphone, getting the confidence to write something and press enter. And then for some people, it might be really awkward and uncomfortable. And why is no one saying anything? And it just, it, it tends to kind of bring out that perception that something is wrong, right? There's some kind of miscommunication. So these are just some of them. Um, obviously, you brought up more. And added to this, I thought I'd bring up um, some research that I found really interesting. Um, so this is from an article that made the rounds in April, May about Zoom fatigue and you know, the drain that comes with performing online. So uh, this is an infographic someone made, which I think is really great. Um, and it talks about how we have to work much harder to process all the information coming at us. And whenever there's a delay, even if it's 1.2 seconds, we're automatically considering that to, to denote some kind of communication breakdown. People are not really liking my idea. So we have to kind of engage with that silence and reframe it often because it's so quick to go to that negative. Why is no one speaking? Why is no one responding to my question? So, you know, as we go through the presentation, we will talk about practical considerations, but I find this a really helpful reframe to think when I'm encountering that silence, maybe it might not be that negative uh, connotation, but could be a lot of other things. Um, and sometimes you can gauge that from your audience or, or sometimes what I call leaning into the silence can help. Like if you ask a question and you say, I'm just going to pause for about 20 seconds to give folks time to process this. That allows you to kind of reclaim that facilitation uh, stance that, you know, this is something that we're trying to create more engagement with. And it allows other participants to kind of, you know, do their own thing, however they want to participate, especially if you have a couple of different avenues for them to do that, not just getting on the microphone, turning on the camera, but giving you some uh, context anonymously, right? Sometimes I tell students, if there's a question that you'd like me to answer, but you don't want to kind of be the owner of that question, private message me and then I'll anonymize it as I uh, relate it back to the audience, right? So just a couple of different ways to, you know, work with what people's comfort level is online, but then also using silence to your advantage whenever possible. So uh, let's start off with um, an interactive activity, uh, which is a scenario. So I will read it out loud just in case folks are having trouble seeing the screen. Let's think about in the future, you're facilitating a session over Zoom and you're really hoping to engage your audience so that you can integrate their ideas, right? You don't want it to be a monologue, you want it to be a two-way street. However, you find that your carefully planned activities, for example, polls and word clouds, et cetera, aren't genera generating any responses. Additionally, the lack of eye contact with your audience is making you second guess the impact of your content. To fill these gaps and silences, you use stalling techniques like you fill the gap, but the overall lack, overall lack of participation throws you off course. You begin to speed up out of nervousness and then you start to make errors. Okay, so this is something that maybe some folks have already experienced. 
So two questions here for you to think about in your groups. Uh, what can you do in the moment to troubleshoot? So as you're experiencing this and those nerves are going up and you're feeling that silence, what are some strategies you might use, some things you might say or repurpose the, the material to make it more engaging? And then the second question is, how can you proactively plan for this happening? So before your presentation, how can you have that plan B, plan C to anticipate some of these challenges, right? Whether it's silence, whether it's the activities not going according to plan, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is just drop this slide in the chat so you, everyone has access to it. So give me a second to do that. Um, so then you can refer to it as you're chatting and then we'll be good to go. Um, Zoom scenario, open. So it should be uploading. Uh, let me know if you don't see it in the chat. It should be called zoomscenario.pdf. And I think we can go into, yes, I see some thumbs up. That's awesome. And I think we can move into breakout rooms now. Okay, I think folks are slowly coming back. So I'll give them a few seconds. There must be some good conversations in the other groups. <laughs> Okay, so I'm seeing the magic number 20. Oh, wow, 34 ish. Okay, so most people should be back by now, which is great. I uh, hope you had a great discussion. Uh, I'm just wondering, so let's uh, debrief that. Um, if you want to enter your thoughts in the chat, or if anyone's feeling super confident to activate their microphone, what are some of the strategies you thought of about during the session, how you can recalibrate, troubleshoot, or proactively plan for some of these uh, issues occurring? Um, in our group, um, there are a few ideas that came up about um, addressing it in the moment. So one person said, um, just call it out and say what it is like, okay, um, we're having a bit of silence right now. Does anyone need clarity on the questions? Um, do we need a break? So just um, saying it as it is. Um, some other ideas were to um, work with a co-facilitator um, to field questions and um, provide clarification on the question, make it simpler in case it was overwhelming. Um, another example was to, like you had mentioned earlier, just say, I'm going to wait until somebody responds and that's, that's the expectation. So you're managing expectations. Um, you can just say how long it can take. Um, and then in terms of um, pre-facilitation, pre um, just the major suggestion was to have somebody with you to monitor the chat while you're facilitating on the, the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. That, those are all great. I especially what you loved what you said about taking a break. Um, you know, we might be barreling forward with a lot of content, which is a lot online, right? Because folks have to kind of listen, digest, maybe they're Googling something. So just giving them a couple of seconds to stretch, go do something else, come back, if that's within the capacity and time frame, can be really great. And the other piece is um, having a, a co-facilitator, someone to monitor the chat and help with troubleshooting so you can really focus on the facilitation piece, and we'll talk about that for sure. Thank you. Anyone else have a, a thought they want to share? We had a question from our breakout group was, um, do you think, or when do you think it would be appropriate to call out specific people for feedback or a response? That's a great question. It came up at a, another session I was doing last week around, um, I feel that if there's a group of participants who are in the same cohort, folks know each other fairly well, it's the kind of program where there's a lot of discussion-based learning. Um, and everyone is, has kind of bought into that and is, 
ready to kind of be called upon, I think that can be great, right? Because it's motivating people and encouraging them that their ideas are worthwhile. I think in a space where folks don't know each other really well, it can feel very, um, it can heighten a lot of people's anxiety, especially if they're more the kind of people who want to write something out. So I would definitely employ that strategically, very thoughtfully about who's in the room. Um, maybe negotiate that with your audience beforehand to say, hey, I'm gonna be calling on a couple of folks just so you know, so they have adequate time to prepare and get that confidence boost up. Okay, any other thoughts? Before we move on. We talked a little bit also about how it really depends on the nature of your group and whether this is a group of adults or a group of children, a group of people who know each other, who don't know each other, who meet regularly. Um, the dynamics of what's going on with that particular group will to a certain extent dictate how you respond to those questions. Absolutely, 100 percent. And one of the things we were talking about um, as you were all in the breakout rooms is um, how anonymizing, creating a space for people to post reflections, but it isn't tied to their screen name, can be very helpful like Mentimeter, um, the visualization software you were uh, using, because that just allows people to be a bit more honest, give you that candor without having to worry about that sort of um, how does it look, right? Or is this a silly question? So it's just something to consider as you're building up towards more engagement, starting off small, things that are polls, to get people more comfortable in the online space. Okay, thanks so much everyone for your, your thoughts on that. We're gonna move on to kind of uh, the four domains, but I just wanted to share this infographic with you from Joe Bowler, who's a professor at Stanford. And I find this really helpful to look at uh, in terms of a checklist as I'm doing presentations online, just to think about, am I incorporating some of these practices around not flooding uh, participants with too much information, right? So the first area there is to minimize. So, you know, adults might have 10 minutes of capacity to kind of engage with ideas before they need to apply it or do something with it, right? And even less for children. Um, some great points about multimodal, multidimensional ways of um, engaging your audience outside of text. Um, so activities, obviously people are thinking about that, right? To actually have their participants do something with the material. Um, checking in for understanding and comprehension and feedback. Things like so far so good, or, can you see my slides? Just create that you know, connection with your audience. Um, and um, you know, the last space is creating some open space considerations, right? So uh, the whiteboard on Zoom, people can stamp things or write in text. And again, this is anonymous and a way to encourage the expertise in the room. So just thought you'd be interested in that um, infographic. And it's something I look at often before I'm designing some kind of online activity. Okay, so um, moving into the first domain around delivery, speed, and pacing, I'm going to pick up my own pace a little bit because I realized we have 30 minutes left, um, but I can definitely share these slides for you to review after if that is um, useful to you. So the first thing I would say is in the online space, because we're not sure about technology lags um, and we're using closed captioning, uh, hopefully you can see the, the one I'm using at the bottom of the screen, it's really helpful to enunciate each word if you can, even though it might feel, feel counterintuitive about wanting to speed up and really get to the, the real content. Because what happens is um, as good as these technologies can be, they can mis misunderstand what you're saying. Um, so just slowing down, enunciating, avoiding reductions and contractions, I felt really helps just kind of help that clarity and accuracy of the speech to text transcription. Um, and also being aware that we have multilingual audiences, right, and users of English as an additional language. So how can we make sure that, you know, first of all, that our information is as clear as possible? Um, and then thinking about, you know, because we have this camera in our face, what can we show beyond just this, right? Can we, you know, take a step back from our computer, experiment with different frames and think creatively? And also using gesture, um, you know, changing up our affect, our pitch and tone creates that variation to make it more interesting for um, the participant. And then the last area is, I know some people might feel a little bit uncomfortable with this strategy, but if you can, if it's within your capacity and not too painful, I find recording myself can be very helpful because first of all, it helps me capture anything that I'm not aware of. So any kind of padding or filler sounds like like or um, if I want to get rid of them, uh, that might be good to say, okay, how can I replace that with something else? Um, or another strategy I found uh, useful is hiding your own camera stream on the day of a presentation. Because if you see yourself in the corner, it might not be the most useful feedback and you might sort of start second guessing um, what you're doing. So if it's helpful, minimizing that to make sure you can focus on content 
can be a helpful sort of, I'm going to get that out of my way and not be distracted. Um, something that I found really helpful is um, this notion of boxed breathing. So I don't know if anyone's tried this before, uh, if you can say in the chat. Um, often what happens is when we are presenting um, and we're experiencing some kind of nervousness, we tend to breathe very shallowly. So we breathe into our shoulders and we take very, very small amounts of air, but we really need to sustain that for much longer, more complex sentence structures. So often what happens is we take a shallow breath, we start speaking, we realize we need to take a breath in the middle of an idea and then it becomes this really vicious cycle. So um, if it's possible, trying to think about deep breathing into your diaphragm, um, I'm not sure if my slide is actually showing you that animation there, but again, can send it out after. But it's really a conscious deep breathing to make sure it's in your diaphragm so you can sustain a longer turn. Um, so one trick I uh, found really helpful is putting your hand on your belly and making sure you're feeling that rounded feeling on your stomach. That shows that you have enough sort of depth to really sustain that um, longer turn. Um, so in with the nose, out with the mouth, pretending the balloon is, uh, pretending the belly is a balloon um, is a good sort of thing to keep in mind, especially if that nerves um, piece is coming into, um, coming into the fray. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on as well is the notion of using notes very strategically. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have your cheat sheets, your agenda items, and ways to keep you on track. Um, but one thing to, to think about is when we have some kind of visual aid to lift our ideas from, um, making sure that your ideas are easily located. So spacing them out and not you know, using a script where it's in sentence structure, because often what happens is when we're in a pinch feeling nervous, we might go to our notes and start reading from them. So if they are sort of keywords, visualizations, pointers to help prompt your memory, that allow you to get back on track and use a little bit more of an authentic, natural um, tone. Um, and you know, just building on this idea, uh, remember that your content needs to be spoken out loud. So if you are um, practicing your content, think about ways where you can condense. So if you need to speed up, you can just get rid of that. Or if you've been speeding up and you have a lot of extra time at your disposal, what can be expanded upon? So I, ever, I never feel like deleting things are a good idea because you might need that to fill some kind of gap. So if your notes are pliable, they're spaced out, there's something that you can refer to very quickly in the moment, that's a good um, aid as well, just to keep your performance as natural as possible. I just wanted to give you here a quick example of a presentation script, which again, you know, there, there might be that inclination to read if you are in a pinch. And something that I've started using more is this notion of visual note taking. So again, key ideas, big bolded words, um, diagrams, I can look, get back on track really quickly. So that's something to consider. Um, I see a question in the chat about what, what do we do when people don't have their cameras on? I'll definitely uh, get to this towards the end when we're talking about uh, more of that engagement piece. Okay, and some final thoughts on performance. Um, if you can, sometimes I find it useful to look at one person who does have their camera on and establishing eye contact and delivering the presentation to them, um, especially if the other options are just like a sea of black boxes. So some of you have turned your cameras on, which is awesome. So I can see all of you and sort of note, is there some kind of cue there, right? Are people looking confused? Are they sort of putting their hand up? So pausing, leaning into that silence of, hey, I'm gonna scan all of your camera feeds just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, that can just create that sense of ease and comfort for you as the facilitator. Um, I'm just going to boost over that section because it's about emphasizing water over coffee, which is a good strategy just to keep your throat lubricated to avoid dehydration. The last thing here I wanted to really highlight is sometimes when we're asked a question or um, we're, we're trying to kind of expand on a more complex idea, really try to lean into that pause uh, for yourself to take that breath maybe writing down the question or asking another question to clarify. Uh, because sometimes we feel like we need to answer questions right on the spot. And if we hold that silence, that just helps us problem solve a little bit more effectively rather than just speaking um, and filling that silence as well. Okay, uh, before we move to audience engagement, are folks doing okay? Um, any questions so far? I'm gonna scan all of your cameras to make sure you're all good. Okay, I'm seeing some nodding, great. All is well, thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so we're getting to the kind of the meat and potatoes of the presentation, the audience engagement piece. So, you know, a lot of you touched on in the sort of icebreakers that we're, we're all sort of 
thinking about safety and comfort different, differently online. Um, and I'm not sure what my point was there about icebreakers, um, but basically we have to think about what are some low stakes ways to engage our audience without jumping to sort of what do you all think and getting that silence. So starting off with some very easy yes or no questions, moving to the open ended um, can be a good way to stagger what you're expecting your audience to do. Sometimes I, you know, someone says name it, um, you know, name the awkwardness and that can be helpful to kind of relate to your audience saying, this is a little bit strange for me too. And I'm also maybe misinterpreting things online. So, you know, jump in, private message me. That's a way to kind of create that safety for folks who might be a little bit reluctant to kind of hit the ground running. Um, we talked about this already, but anonymizing tools like Mentimeter can help just sort of get people comfortable with sharing things without having to own their idea or question. And um, what I found often helpful is when we're thinking for input, when we're asking that question, hey, what do you all think? Try to think about what that user ex is experiencing on that end, right? So if they need a bit more time, leaning into that pause, letting people type, letting people you know, boost up that confidence to say something, or counting down in your own head for 10 seconds before moving on. Because that desire to fill the silence, you might think, I just want to make sure that this is not getting too awkward, but then we might be taking away a chance for someone who's actually building up that courage to speak. Um, so just kind of fighting our instincts to say, I'm filling that silence. Actually, maybe I'm just gonna take a second or maybe ask another question that's a little bit more um, inviting, less complex. Um, because sometimes, you know, we ask that question and we realize it's a bit ambitious and we need to kind of um, make it more accessible for people. Um, okay, I just have a suggestion in the chat. If, um, if you can just make sure you're all on mute because someone's hearing a bit of feedback, um, that would be great. Um, some more um, tips on audience engagement. Uh, what I found really helpful is if you can give folks um, the materials they need to really thrive and succeed in the online space, that's a great idea. So if you're sharing the slides, any handouts, agenda items for a meeting can really help people have that sense of direction. Of course, we give maybe an agenda in the beginning, but if they have it in front of them, it's a bit more tangible. If you can upload them to a shared drive, I know a lot of you are in groups um, or clubs, associations, where if there is a community of practice, people can just log on, get what they need, rather than you having to send it out over email. So just to save a bit of time there. Um, you all were in breakout rooms previously. So sometimes when we're asking a question to a big group, there is that performance anxiety of there are 60 people in this chat. Whatever I put into that box is, you know, archived forever. So if we have smaller groups, perhaps that helps people come out of their shell a little bit more. Um, and when assigning a task, maybe just giving everyone what they need to successfully complete that task. So the questions, the slide, the material you're asking them to engage with is a really good practice. And I think also this sounds super basic, I know, but being very clear about expectations from your audience. So what are you telling them to do? So, hey, for everyone for today, we're gonna to be doing some activities. I'm gonna give you a scenario or even assert what you need as the presenter, right? And you might feel you know, differently about this, but um, I sort of leverage my vulnerability sometimes of, hey, everyone, I'm having a bit of an off day. Um, you know, some extra feedback would be great or, um, you know, if I'm speaking really fast, can you just let me know so I kind of calibrate and make sure that I'm slowing down to meet all of your needs. So, you know, this creates another relatability um, consideration with your audience because they see you as one of them, basically. Um, and it just creates this reciprocal relationship of give and take. So being clear about that up front, um, even when it's just things around feedback or what will help you succeed as, as a facilitator can be very helpful. Um, just zooming in on this notion of silence, I wanted to present this visualization of conversation patterns. Um, so I'm gonna let folks kind of sit with it for about 20 seconds. And just to tell you that the blue box and the red box represent different speakers. So think about the, the three tiers here and the first one where we have two speakers and then the second example and then the third example. Okay, everyone, so um, 
I just want to invite what you think. So in the first tier, what do you think is going on? Um, Barbara notes in the first one, they were actually talking over each other. Yep. So there's actually overlap. Um, this could be to some people interruption. You know, some people look at this visual graphic and think, oh, these people are not hearing each other. In some contexts, it might be engagement and showing that I'm really invested in your ideas, so I'm finishing your sentence, right? So depending on what the power dynamics are there, but at the basic level, it's um, some kind of overlap. How about in the second example? What do you think is going on there? So, you know, to, to generalize, maybe in classroom spaces, in business meetings, there is this notion of turn taking, right? I'm going to deliver my ideas. I'm going to cue my signal to end my turn and then hopefully someone will pick it up. Right. So someone mentioned in the chat conversation going back and forth. Right. You, you speak, then I speak. Someone else takes a turn. The third one. Uh, what do you think is going on there? It, it kind of looks like this uh, presentation that you're doing. Okay, so now you have you're asking a question, a question waiting for a response, a patiently waiting, and then someone kind of steps up and, and says, so hey, here's a response. Seconds. Yeah, thanks for that. So this is a, a perfect example of virtual facilitation because there is going to be, no matter how much we try, some kind of lag, right? Um, that's a great observation there. Um, some people note that it might be an awkward space and or giving people time to think. Um, thought gaps, people thinking very separately. Yep. So you're all thinking about how that pause might be leveraged differently for different folks, right? For some of us, it might be awkward. I need to fill it. But for some of us, it might might be that necessary time to kind of reflect, digest before we um, we jump back in. So just to think about in that online space, we are going to have those lags. We're going to have those silences rather than trying to kind of mitigate them always or fill them or people are not really engaging really leaning into them, repurposing them, reframing them, right? And, and sort of actively giving folks something to do. So look at this, we'll take 20 seconds, and that allows people to kind of boost their confidence and get comfortable, right? So uh, just something to think about is, you know, we might be aiming for the second tier where there is this natural turn taking, but we're really having to kind of navigate this pause and, and kind of frame it for our, our own benefit. Okay, just, Keeping sense of the time, we have 15 minutes. So um, moving on to accessibility, which is something, of course, we're all mindful of in the online space. Um, if you can, closed captioning is something that is a part of many platforms now. So I'm using PowerPoint to um, have captioning, which is pretty accurate, I'm finding, um, and able to keep up with the flow. Um, another third party source you might consider is Otter AI, which is an open source speech to text um, software. So what you can do is activate that, you know, share the link with someone, and then they'll be able to see your ideas um, in live time. So if you know your PowerPoint doesn't have this feature, you have to have the most updated operating system. Um, that's a great software to consider. Another benefit of Otter AI is um, if you're ever thinking about uh, voice memos and dictation and you don't want to keyboard something or write it down, this will capture all of your ideas and you can shape it into an email or an essay. So it's, it's actually a way to kind of minimize that screen time if you're feeling that visual fatigue of, I just can't look at my device anymore. Um, this is a way to capture everything you're saying and you don't have to look at uh, your screen. A plus there. Um, another thing that uh, can be helpful is just having reinforcement through if I have something on my screen, I'm going to read it out loud or I'm going to have some kind of other way to convey that information so it's not so text dependent. Um, I haven't really followed that today with my text heavy slides, but it's because I wanted to kind of give you a full scope of each strategy. Um, you know, if you don't have slides at your disposal, again, those paralinguistics can be helpful to practice, whether recording yourself or asking for feedback to see how your message is being um, received. And then, you know, this sounds again straightforward, but having those check ins regularly. So, um, you know, on Zoom, some of you were doing a thumbs up, which was a great way for me to assess, you know, are, am I making sense? Are things going okay? But, you know, having those sort of fostering that inclusive environment by creating a conversation. So, are we doing good so far? Um, is my screen visible? It creates that connection with your audience. Um, and it's not just sort, sort of your typical presentation. Um, I'll move through this quickly because you can review it um, at your own pace. But if you are going to be using slides, here are some things that might be useful to, to take away with. 
Um, I often find that less is more. So, you know, if you're creating that visual space, things are inviting, easily retrievable. Um, that's a great way to have people kind of use your slides to kind of connect it to your speaking rather than reading it and then incorporating your listening. So it is a, a tricky balance sometimes I find, but um, just getting away from the strategy of using your, your PowerPoints to actually inform everything. Um, if you are using photographs, making sure that you explain them um, and they're not just filling up space. Um, using high contrast, large size fonts like Arial or Calibri, I've heard are the best ones because they're sans serif. Um, so they're, they're less likely to cause um, uh, miscommunication or if someone has a reading difficulty like dyslexia, they're going to, um, it's going to mitigate that a little bit more. Um, the PowerPoint um, has a check accessibility feature under review. So um, it'll highlight you to any kind of pictures that are missing alternative text or if anything's really crowded, it might just say, hey, do you want to think this again? And there's a link there uh, for Accessible Campus, which has some, some really good tips about using PowerPoint effectively. Okay, I think this is our last domain. Um, and this is really about monitoring and checking in for feedback. So um, I think we've all noticed that when you are trying to do facilitation online, it's very hard to multitask, right? It's hard to do the back end of getting the technology ready and then being prepared with your delivery and all of your content and then also administering polls and, and you know, scanning the chat. So um, just to make sense of that, you know, it's just to say that I'm going to not try to do this all by myself and actually uh, depend on people to help me out with it. So if you have someone on your team to kind of take care of that troubleshooting, um, using their strengths to kind of have that plan B, plan C, it just allows you to focus on your material a bit more. Um, and, you know, things like microphone and camera tests. Um, is the Wi-Fi stable for you? Have you had that dress rehearsal if it's a high stakes presentation? Um, and using that again for feedback and monitoring. So just uh, some practical tips there. Okay, so I'm going to pause here before we get to Q&A, but um, I'm going to look at the, the chat for questions. And, you know, I, I'd love to hear from other people in the room because you all have such great strategies as well, I'm sure. Um, but there was something about what do we do when people don't want to turn their cameras on? Um, so I think this goes back to that safety piece for people um, and not assuming that if they have their cameras off, they must not be engaged, right? Um, I've had students who tell me that they're listening to a presentation on their phone, but they're, you know, doing something else like taking care of a child or having to do something that is, is more pressing, but they're still involved. So just to kind of get over that hurdle of cameras off means bad. Actually, cameras off might be that people are doing a couple of other things, but still engaged in their own way. And making that um, just, uh, if, 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 if you feel comfortable with it, just inviting that as a legitimate way of participating. And then the next step is maybe to think about, okay, what do people need in order to turn their cameras on? So you might need to make the case that, hey, we're doing a couple of activities where having your camera on will help with that interpersonal reading of the room. People can look at your face for cues. It'll just make the conversation less burdened with the sort of what's going on, you know, using the chat all the time. So kind of making a case for why having their cameras on is actually helping them participate more effectively and boosting that confidence. Um, but if other people have some, some thoughts there, I'd love to hear them. But I think it is about sort of acknowledging why there might be that barrier and then working with the audience to kind of negotiate some kind of shared understanding and mutual benefit on both sides. Um, Okay, just going ahead. Um, how do you go about recording webinars and getting consent for, from participants being filmed, especially if you ask them to unmute and speak up? So th this is a great question and it sort of speaks to that expectations piece. Um, and, you know, making sure people feel that, you know, if you are entering something in the chat, it is visible to everyone. And, uh, you know, the recording of the webinars will be uploaded to a specific audience. So it's going to be shared with, you know, a faculty, a certain group of people. Um, so to kind of like share that um, upfront and, you know, if people want to self-select out, making sure that's uh, available to them as well. Um, has anyone had to do public engagement virtually yet? Um, I'm wondering if that's a question posed to the ent entire group. Does someone want to jump in there? Oh, sure. And just a little background. Um, I work for an electric utility, and when we have projects, we oftentimes have to uh, go and have open houses. Um, but with COVID, it's becoming uh, very complicated. So we are exploring the idea of, of doing things uh, remotely. 
And I'm just curious if anyone's had to do that yet. So anyone have some strategies that they've used for engaging audiences in different contexts, so maybe outside of presentations or facilitation? Um, so, hi, uh, Lauren here. Um, the organization I work for was part of an effort where we, we planned and we staged, I think it was two different kind of like online e-rallies with, um, in both cases, over a thousand participants because it was like you had the thousand Zoom participants and then because we live streamed on a couple different websites and um, social media accounts, there was there was more because of that. Um, and I would say like, honestly, in terms of like big success um, and like sort of like best practices, um, instead of having <laughs> a thousand people have the option to unmute themselves and, and to speak up, um, we really, really utilized the chat function and we had a bunch of, um, sort of uh, facilitators monitoring just that and pulling questions all the time um, for speakers to address. Uh, we had two really, really awesome facilitators who were really high energy and really knowledgeable on the topic. Um, and one of the things that really, really helped set a tone at the beginning of the event, obviously because it was designed to be really high energy, was um, uh, we put together a playlist and played music at the beginning of, at the beginning and the end of the webinar and then in between every transition as well. So there was always sort of um, fun, upbeat audio to plug into uh, when we were changing to a different sort of setting or conversation to, to keep the energy up. Very cool, thank you, a thousand. I've never uh, dealt with anything on that scale, but it does bring to mind sort of you know, your audience size, right? It's a big difference between five people to a thousand. So how can you create other ways for people to feel engaged without that turning on the mic, right? That sort of typical notion of participation. Um, another thing I was thinking of, someone brought up this asynchronous component and that pre-work, that homework that you might assign can be helpful, not only for boosting that audience, but creating some kind of um, scaffolding around learning, right? If that's the goal. So read this article and then we'll unpack it rather than assigning it in the presentation or having to summarize it even because it trusts that people will finish it on their own time so you're kind of creating that or I, I leave this to you and whatever you do with it is is your choice but then it makes that conversation in person online um, that much more robust and exciting because we've kind of molded over we've had time to process it um, yeah I believe the presentation uh, for sure can be shared the slides uh, definitely so uh, we can share that through um, Jessica I believe Okay, um, I just want to make sure I, I, I didn't miss anyone's question, but um, I'm going to go to kind of our last slide where it's a space for um, if you wanted to share one takeaway that you've got in this, you know, really compressed hour or if there are any other additional questions that you wanted to highlight um, other challenges or nuances that we didn't quite get to. Uh, this is the time to do it. Oh, great. So Jessica says uh, you'll get an email from Eventbrite later this week with uh, the link and the slides. Oh, great. So folks are checking in. Um, yeah, so checking in with your audience as a strategy. Yep, absolutely. And folks, um, yeah, thank you for, for joining. Um, I'll just uh, hang around to see if anyone else has any questions or other comments. Um, yeah, thank you for joining. I know this is kind of, you know, a, a first step for thinking about facilitation strategies, but um, maybe I'll just go ahead because some people might be leaving. Um, academic success is um, under the division of student life. That's where I work. So uh, a learning strategist basically helps students with all areas of academic performance, um, everything from effective note taking, how do I deal with all the readings, um, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling, I'm feeling like an imposter in my program. How do I navigate identity and learning those pieces? So um, if that feels like uh, something that might be beneficial for you to attend workshops on, but, or um, talk to me one-on-one -on -one or another learning strategist, please uh, follow that link. It gives you a really good indication of our services and uh, all of our uh, programs that you might join, like a grad writing group or, you know, everything under that umbrella. And I'll just share my email address on the next slide if you wanted to get in touch directly. Um, and I'm happy to make an appointment with you um, to kind of go around that booking system process. But um, yeah, we'll just pause here and uh, 
stay on if anyone has any additional questions. Right, so some people are feeling thought, like more confident about dealing with silences, you know, cameras being off, um, thinking through accessibility. Yep, so I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we could talk about that together and, and crowdsource some thoughts there. Yeah, thanks so much for joining everyone. Anonymized feedback, yeah. That has definitely been my saving grace in the sort of quiet <laughs> when you're trying to elicit some kind of reaction and going to that anonymizing source gives you material to work with, right? Because people are engaging, albeit through their own way, right? A little bit more indirect, but still valid. Yeah, not feeling anxious about blank cameras. Yeah, for sure, right? It's not a statement on you. It's more about how people are perceiving what they're expected to do, right? And committing to the space. Sometimes I find that's another thing of, if I turn on my camera, I'm beholden to this space for another hour. So people are kind of testing the waters and seeing if they want to <laughs> stay online for the, whole, for the whole time, you know? So it's, it's good. People are being discerning about their time and how they choose to engage because time is precious and, and time online is draining. So I always think of that as a good thing, right? Of like, if people stay on, then you can kind of negotiate again if people are feeling comfortable um, activating their mics and cameras. Okay, um, so I guess we can start wrapping up, Jessica, if that's okay. We're at uh, 1.59, and, uh, but if someone wanted to ask a question using their mic, totally game. All right, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, this officially concludes our webinar. Um, what, as I mentioned on the chat, um, I'll be sending everyone that was registered a link for the recorded webinar as well as the slides that um, Yassine will share with us. So yeah, thank you so much and feel free to send um, either Yassine questions for about content or um, to me for any, anything else you want to see the School of the Environment put together this year and any feedback. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I put my email in the chat once more just in case uh, folks needed it. Okay, I'll sign off. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.